Hey, what's up? Good to be talk again. There are strange creatures that come from the shadows. Strange creatures that seem to use shadows as doorways. In this video, we're gonna explore the strange phenomenon. For thousands of years, humanity has been scared of the dark. The witching hour, the devil's hour. Actually, let me look this up. Actually, I'll use ChatGPT. New. What are some other sayings for the witching app? So as we're approaching Halloween, Halloween's often thought of as the month where spirits are more connected to this earth or the veil between worlds is lifted. A lot of cultures believe that in the witching hour. So different cultures call it different things. Some places call it the midnight hour, a time during the night when more supernatural events happen. The devil's hour, sometimes used synonymously with the witching hour, but is often specifically re referring to the time between three and 4 a.m a period that some believe is particularly conductive to paranormal events. And then the hour of the wolf. In Swedish folklore, this refers to the period between 3 and 5 a.m., which is associated with supernatural events. The ghost hour in Asia, Horabruxa in Portuguese, which translates to the witch hour and is used in similar contexts to the witching hour. And Spanish, they call it La Hora Bruja, La Hora Bruja, the witching hour. And even in Germany, they call it Mitterrand, Mitterschacht, Mitternacht. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Anyway, in German, they call it Mitter, Mitternacht meaning midnight, but folklore midnight is often associated with increased supernatural activity. So across the board, other cultures believe darkness is associated with the supernatural. Why do cultures across the world all believe that darkness is associated with the supernatural? So many cultures believe that October is a month of heightened supernatural activity. And the reason for this is because it's starting to get into fall time where things start to get darker. And when things start to get darker, more supernatural activities happen. Just like the witching hour, which is midnight, October or the months leading to fall when winter starts to come are associated with heightened paranormal activity because increase in darkness. Why do so many cultures around the world believe that darkness and the supernatural are linked? And this goes into a lot of my theories. If you follow my channel, I actually talk about this a lot. Darkness and shamanism are linked. Shamans will often black out rooms and turn off the breaker boxes before they do shamanism. In houses, you'll notice that people who have hauntings, it always happens in a dark room. My theory about this is it has to, something to do with electromagnetic frequencies. Electromagnetic frequencies, like light, and how it interferes with creatures or other realities ability to interact with this world. So before I get more into this, let's delve into some of these strange stories about how darkness is linked to mysterious creatures that seem to come from the shadows. For some time now, I've grappled with an eerie experience I can't quite explain. I'm 18 years old, and I'm unsure if age plays a part in what I've witnessed, but I feel it might be significant. Several months ago, while I was resting in bed around 10.30pm, a peculiar event occurred. Despite how early it was, my surroundings were imprinted clearly in my memory. The hallway light outside my room was glowing dimly. I never sleep with my door open because the normally dark corridor unsettles me, but on this particular night, my door was ajar. Through the slight gap, I spotted a black figure. It looked eerily human, but was as black as a shadow. The entity had scraggly short hair draping in front of its face, resembling a male version of Samara from the movie The Ring. Only its shoulders and head were visible, as though the rest of its body was hidden behind the door frame. 
Curiously, I was wearing an eye mask that allowed me to peek out from underneath. Pretending to be asleep, I watched this mysterious figure intently. As our eyes met, it swiftly retreated and silently closed my door. This was strange since my door usually creaked and clicked loudly when shut. The next morning, I inquired with my parents if they'd been around my room, but both denied it. I brushed off the incident, attributing it to an episode of sleep paralysis, something I occasionally experience. However, during such episodes, I usually hallucinate a tarantula, never a humanoid figure. But things took an unsettling turn the following night. Around the same hour, the shadowy figure reappeared, this time holding what looked like a bottle. Unlike the previous encounter, when I stared at it, it didn't vanish immediately. Only when I mustered the courage to move my arm did the figure depart, silently closing my door behind it. This movement on my part ruled out sleep paralysis. The episodes didn't recur, but my mind kept revisiting them. Lately, I've been immersing myself in urban legends. One particular tale about the boogeyman grabbed my attention. The description eerily matched the figure I saw, save for the hooded cloak the boogeyman is said to wear. Traditionally, the boogeyman is believed to target children, which makes me wonder about my age in relation to the encounter. Could it have been the boogeyman or something else entirely? While I remain uncertain, I'm eager to know what others might think of my experience. This story has a couple of very important points that I'd like to emphasize. Number one, when this strange, dark, shadowy creature retreated, it retreated back to the closet and it closed the door in order to leave. As if the closet was its escape from being seen or spotted by the girl. So closets are generally, they generally don't have much wiring. It might have a light on the ceiling, but the majority of the closet isn't going to have like a lot of plugs or electricity in there. You're just going to hang clothes. So a closet would be a perfect place for a supernatural being that needed low levels of electromagnetic frequencies in order to open a doorway to come through. For some reason, when it comes to other realities or parallel versions of Earth, electromagnetic frequencies seem to interfere with their ability to interact with this world. At one point it was holding a bottle. So it was digging around and grabbing stuff and when it knew it was being observed by the girl, it escaped. Like it didn't want to be observed. And if you watch a lot of these uh, videos about shadow people, they poke their head out and then they retreat. They poke their head out and retreat. If someone sees them, they're gone. They don't want to be seen. I don't know why they, they don't want to be observed, but they seem to be scared. They seem, it seems almost like a fear reaction. They wait till people are asleep. They need a dark area with low amounts of EMFs to open a doorway. So often when they're spotted and they need to retreat, they go back to that dark area where their doorway is and they escape back through the doorway. A final point I want to make about this first story is the silence. The door was squeaky and it made a lot of noise, but for some reason, when the entity closed the door and escaped, the person, the girl observing the entity couldn't hear anything, which makes me think that it created some kind of field in order to enter this realm and sound waves cannot escape that field whatever physics is going on that this creature created in order to open a portal to this world it stops sound which kind of leads credence to the idea that when they open this dimensional bubble this pocket in order to travel between worlds like through a wormhole or however they do it if you're inside the field that they open to open a portal, you can't hear anything outside of it. So the wind won't make any noise, but anything that's making noise inside that bubble, you'll be able to hear as if you're in a soundproof zone, which is a scientific clue to what's going on with these creatures. It's not just, oh, everything goes quiet because it's spooky. Uh, I don't know why, it's just eerie. There's a reason behind it. Everything that's happening in these stories, there's a reason, but this doesn't only happen in houses this also happens in the wilderness in this next story 
A guy encounters strange supernatural creatures that come from the darkness of the woods. In the secluded woodlands surrounding Memphis, I've encountered enigmatic entities since 2020, towering humanoid figures. They're defined by their hunting pitch black eyes and a profoundly disturbing manner of movement, erratic and disjointed, reminiscent of the horror movie, The Ring. Their movements were so jerky and unpredictable that they seemed to defy the natural physics of our world. My first encounter was on Thanksgiving night, 2020. I visited a veteran friend, weathering a tough phase. He resided in a ramshackle camper, stationed on the fringe of the woods on his brother's estate. Nearby were the remnants of a tornado ruined trailer with an operational streetlight affixed to its electricity pole. Beyond this pole, approximately 15 yards of a meadow unfurled, split by an ancient dirt road. This expanse culminated in thickets marking the onset of the dense forest. At first glance, I misperceived these specters for humans, skulking in dimmer regions where the pole's glow waned. My friend nonchalantly commented on these omnipresent phantoms, asserting their harmless demeanor. He emphasized their elusive character, insisting it was impossible to approach them. Being a seasoned veteran with two deployments to my name and armed, I felt compelled to investigate. Drawing nearer, their milky white visage and abyssal hollow eyes became clearer. Their population seemed to surpass 50, dispersed across the field, along the dirt path, and looming at the forest's periphery. A surge of bravado propelled me forward, but as I ventured closer, they unified their sinister gaze upon me. This gaze combined with their eerie, jerky movements, like a broken film reel from the ring, engulfed me in a terror I'd never known. That night, I couldn't face them. Concerned for my friend, I ushered him to the safety of my home. I've since encountered these phantoms about a dozen times, always nocturnally in near woods. Despite attempts to chase them, they evaporate when I near them, especially if I momentarily sever eye contact. Their peculiar, glitch-like motion seemed as if body parts phased out and rematerialized elsewhere. Their elusive nature was accentuated when I unleashed 45 incendiary 5.56 rounds from my AR-15, leaving not a trace. Intriguingly, they produce sounds audible on recording devices, yet defy both digital and analog visual capture. Animals acknowledge their presence, but when presented to other humans, the specters seem selectively visible, only half reported seeing them. Pondering my sanity, I've sought similar accounts online. Some cryptid accounts bear resemblances but aren't wholly aligned. The lore of white zombies and shape-shifting entities provide partial matches. These apparitions manifest in varying sizes, often clustering in what I've coined family clusters, generally a blend of taller and shorter entities. If you watch the movie The Ring and a lot of other horror movies, they often depict the supernatural creature when it starts to come into the house, the lights start to flicker. A lot of people with haunted houses say their lights flicker. And people who have street light interference, you know, the people who make light bulbs flicker when they walk by, they also make light bulbs flicker. So whatever these things are doing, they're emitting some kind of electromagnetic field that interferes with electronics and makes light flicker. These creatures are also staying at the fringes of the light, like they didn't want to be in the electromagnetic field of bright lights shining on them. He also said that some people weren't able to see him, and that one's a little bit of a mystery to me. I don't understand why some people would be able to see it and other people not be able to see it. But I've heard other stories of, like, there'd be three people, two of them will see the thing, and the third person will be looking in the same area and not see anything. Either it's some sort of clairvoyance that people have, or it's like my last video where I talk about uh, Bigfoot beyond the footprints how Bigfoot are able to trick your brain into thinking that they're not there. So maybe some people have a better focus where they're not able to be, they're not able to have their mind mess with. Like if you watch Star Wars and the guy, the Jedi will say, you're gonna let us through, you agree with me. And then the person agrees with them and lets them pass. 
because he thinks that he's not perceiving reality because he's being tricked by the Jedi. If these things are doing something similar where they're able to make us not notice them, that might explain why some people can see them while others can't. The person with better focus, the person with uh, who accidentally trained his brain in the right way, his or her brain in the right way, his brain isn't able to be deceived as easily as somebody else. That might be why some people can see them and others can't. Animals can see them all the time. And we, you hear that a lot. Dogs are reacting to stuff, cats looking at something, but people can't notice it. It might be because those tricks don't work on animals, they only work on people. It might be just like how some people are susceptible to hypnosis while others aren't. And the creature was doing really weird jerky ch -ch 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 movements, just like the ring, just like the grudge, just like how people in Alaska describe movements of the little people. They say they have a very jerky, kind of like a hummingbird, like they're here, they're there, they kind of just jerk around. These creatures are moving in a weird jerky way. I feel like there's time distortion with interdimensional travel. For example, with stories of people encountering the Fae, time moves forward when they only spent a few minutes with them, they could be there for years. So with this disjointed jerky movement, when they open the portal, when they open the doorway to get to this world, their time distortion, since their dimension, flows at a different rate of time than ours. Since they're within the bubble that they opened in order to travel here, if you're outside of that bubble and observing them, the time within the bubble is gonna move at a different rate than the time outside of it. So when you watch them, they're gonna look kind of glitchy because they're moving at a faster rate of time even though they're here inside their field that they created in order to travel here. And when you're observing them from the outside, they look jerky and funny and weird looking. The reason why horror movies use this weird jerky movement with like the grudge and the ring is because a lot of people who see shadow people and other strange, creepy, scary entities in their homes that come out of the closets, that come out of the darkness, they often describe them with this strange, jerky, erratic movement. Even in Skinwalker stories, when they talk about how they mimic people, when people see them, their faces, they kind of weird, jerks like to them to the skinwalker or whatever the heck it is doing it it might just be moving normally but because we're outside of their field that they created in order to come here it looks jerky to us and creepy and that strange unnatural jerkiness is a common trope in horror movies and it's a common trope for a reason because people have been seeing it for thousands of years strange monstrous creatures jerking around walking towards you and it's unnerving, it's bizarre, and we don't understand it. But we are advanced enough where we can start to analyze the data that we're given and start to break it down. So they do not only live in houses, okay? They're in the woods, they're coming out in dark places in the woods too. Let's go on to the next story. Late one evening. I decided to rummage through my cluttered closet, prompted by an eerie incident that occurred an hour prior. That night, something strange was lodged behind a cascade of displaced boxes. I hesitantly illuminated the object with my flashlight. A chilling realization struck me. The entity before me was not human. It bore a sinister appearance with pitch black bony features and eyes as dark as the void. It unleashed a furrow growl that sent shivers down my spine. Fear paralyzed me, yet my mind raced with thoughts that perhaps this was a malicious prank. But when it attacked, shrieking like a banshee and thrashing me against the wall, I understood this was no jest. As it loomed over me, its strength evidently surpassing any human capability. I screamed, desperate for an escape from the terrifying creature that resembled mythological depictions of Satan. Unexpectedly, a shadow flitted into the chaos, pulling me away from the danger and out of the closet. This spectral savior was familiar, reminiscent of a playful entity that had resided in my home since childhood. My imaginary friend who I whimsically likened to Ghost Peter Pan. After ensuring my safety, Ghost Peter Pan re-entered the closet, closing the door behind him. 
Minutes turned into hours, and there was no sign of his return, spawning a whirlwind of guilt within me for perhaps he had sacrificed himself to save me from a hellish fate. Memories of how Ghost Peter Pan had always been there for me, providing company and childish adventures, especially when my constantly working mother couldn't, washed over me with a pang of sorrow. Days trickled by in anxious waiting. My calls for a sign of his presence echoed through the now stagnant energy of my room, receiving no response. My mind wrestled with theories and fears of what might have transpired in the shadowy depths of the closet. Was this an unforeseen act of protection from my ethereal friend? And if so, what was the fate that befell him? couple things stand out to me about the story. Number one, she already had an entity that she called Ghost Peter Pan. Uh, some kind of entity that was already in the house. So that means that the house was a prime place for a portal to open. It had a dark area with no wiring. I imagine that these portals, it doesn't just require a dark closet. It requires some type of an area with certain rock formations or bodies of water that allow the right type of energy to accumulate in an area of electromagnetic energy. That's why there's places called Skinwalker Ranch, the Devil's Lake, Devil's Mountain, whatever, because there's zones on Earth where it's more likely for these entities to be able to come through because the energy's right for them. Some houses are in these zones. These zones aren't incredibly rare. Some are more stronger than others, and they also require darkness. So some houses are going to be more likely to be haunted than others because of their geographic location. Another important aspect of the story is that she was physically slammed against the wall by this thing, and then another entity from one of those other dimensions attacked the entity attacking her and threw it in the closet. And this leads me to believe that these creatures are for sure not spirits or ghosts. They're something else. They're physical and they exist somewhere and they come here through portals that actually exist and they could physically attack us. They could kill us. She also said it looked like the devil and it was pitch black. So the pitch black thing, I went over this in multiple videos. Something to do with interdimensional travel and absorbing energy makes them look really black. And you hear in a lot of cultures and uh, stories about things that look like demons, like the devil. Uh, little people are often described as looking kind of like little devils. They have the hooked nose and the sharp teeth and all that. I think that just means there's some type of weird race of people from another world that look like that. And they know how to travel here. That's what I think that means. This shows that they can be dangerous, they can be predatory. And some missing people might be because they get taken through the portals and attacked by these things. And this girl lucked out and got saved by something else. This next story is also very interesting. It's about a creature that comes out of the shadow from under somebody's bed. Hey Q. It's Scott Coleman here, also known as Deciding Different 272 on YouTube. I had mentioned a rather unsettling experience in the comments section of your recent video about strange occurrences related to things under the bed. You had asked me to elaborate, and although it's taken me a while, mostly because I'm hesitant to relive the memory, I've decided to share my story. When I was around 10 years old, I had an experience that still chills me to the core. One night as I lay in bed restless and anxious about school the next day, I noticed a peculiar movement under the bed. There was just enough light filtering in from the window, casting everything in muted gray tones. The sensation started as a shuffling from beneath, something pressing against the mattress hard enough that I could feel it against my back. It felt as if it was moving between the mattress and the box springs, or maybe even inside the mattress itself. This mysterious entity began moving from beneath me towards the wall. I could both hear and see its progress visualized by a disturbing lump shifting within the mattress. Hoping it was just some stray animal, I cautiously rolled onto my side, creating as much distance between myself and the wall. But then, to my horror, a hand and forearm emerged, reaching upwards between the bed and the wall. The arm was long, and while slender, its musculature was pronounced. In the dim light, its skin appeared gray, with the underside a pale, yellowish hue. The hand pressed down, and as the creature pulled itself up, I caught sight of its face. 
I can only describe its expression as one of relief, but that quickly changed when it turned to face me. Its features contorted from relief to shock, then fear. The being had thin, ragged, dark hair, deep-set eyes, and a crooked nose. Its overall stature was smaller than mine at that age, but it seemed older, more worn. The fear in its eyes mirrored my own, and without breaking our mutual gaze, it began to retreat. Slowly, it lowered itself until only its eyes were visible above the mattress. And then, with a final blink, it disappeared. Shaken, I moved closer to the edge, away from where the creature had been. Just when I thought the ordeal was over, another hand, reminiscent of the first, lunged at me from under the bed, coming frighteningly close to my face. I shut my eyes, bracing for the worse. But when I reopened them, it was morning. The room was filled with the sound of my family preparing for the day. Relieved, I looked around, only to see that same hand still lingering near my face. I instinctively recoiled, but on a second glance, it had vanished. This eerie experience has stayed with me, and even now, the memory sends shivers down my spine. This makes it seem like not all interdimensional travel is at, like they don't know where they're going. This thing was trying to travel between areas through the shadow verse or whatever. I'm going to call it the shadow verse. So Kitavitoak has coined the phrase. I think I got that from a Marvel movie, the shadow verse, but let's call the place where these shadowy creatures come from, where they need the shadow to travel. They open portals and travel. I'm just going to call it the shadow verse. So this thing's traveling from wherever it's from through the shadow verse and he he said it looked really relieved like oh finally i got out and then it saw a kid and it got scared like it was scared of him and it was like oh crap like what is this i don't want to be here i don't want to interact with this person and it went back to where it came from so it accidentally went into his room so it was traveling it was exploring and it accidentally ended up where he was and it did not want to be there so it escaped a lot of these things seem fearful of people they're scared of us i wonder if the reason they're scared of us is because not all of them are intentional interdimensional travelers like imagine if you went into a closet and you're playing as a kid and you're crawling around and then you're like where the f where the hell am i and then you come out and you're in some aliens room like imagine you pop your head out and there's like these weird beings like monstrous beings and you look at them and they're scared of you they're terrified and you're like oh crap and you try to back up and then you're back in your room to you as the kid from your perspective you're just crawling around and you saw monsters and to them living in their world they're just like eating dinner or their equivalent to it in their dimension or whatever. And then some black shadowy hu humanoid thing comes out with dark eyes and black scary skin. And they see it, everything goes quiet for them. And they're wondering what this eerie silence is. And then they see some weird creature come out that has really black inky skin. And they're terrified. I'm sure that's happened. I'm sure a human has accidentally traveled in the Shadowverse to another realm or another world and scared the hell out of their innocent inhabitants. And I'm sure those stories exist where somebody saw monsters and then they got scared, but then from the monster's, per monster's perspective, they were scared of him too. There has, there has to be stories like that out there somewhere. I don't think all these shadow people are intentional. And what if the reason why they're scared of us is because we look like monsters to them and they don't mean to come here all the time. It's an accident. I think it's highly probable that some of them it is accidental, but it's also very probable that a lot of them is intentional and they know what they're doing. This next story shows that there are predators that use the Shadowverse to hunt and to kill. Back in the winter of 2001, my youngest son and I were on our way from Boise, Idaho to Medford, Oregon. We had taken a car trailer to his old place in Boise in order to haul his non-running Jeep to his new place in Medford, 
We hit an area of heavy snow in the southern Cascades around 2 a.m. It took 45 minutes or so to get down the mountain. We had, of course, been drinking coffee to stay alert. About 25 miles west of the pass, it became obvious that the last few quarts of coffee had to be drained. We stopped at a wide spot in the road near a summer tourist haunt, deserted in winter. There is a gas station and ice cream joint on the west side of the road, closed this time of year, and no town or settlement within 30 miles. This is tall timber country and unsettled. Across the road is a small parking area for the ice cream joint. It is paved and about 200 feet wide and 80 feet deep. I pulled in and as I stepped out with a 45 on my hip, it occurred to me in a flash that grabbing the 590 Mossy would be good. As we walked to the far end of the area to be well off the road, the hair on my arms and the back of my neck stood on end. The area directly to our front was open with a depth of 50 yards and a width of 100 yards. The night was clear and cold, 8 to 10 inches of snow on the ground, and with a moon almost full, so we could see quite well. While standing and taking a leak with my son about 15 feet to my right, I saw, as if springing from the earth in front of us across the open area, 10 or 12 creatures moving rapidly back and forth in sort of a crisscross weave pattern. These things, not human men, were close to 7 feet tall, thin, bipedal with long arms, medium-length gray fur, and damned fast on their feet. I brought the shotgun up and slid the safety off as my son was drawing his 45. I don't know if I can adequately explain the overwhelming feeling of menace, but here goes. I had been operating on pure instinct since I had stepped from the pickup. The rotten feeling hit me a split second before the things arrived. The feeling felt like an instinct, was that we were prey and subject to a very bad death, and to be slaughtered and eaten. Not a logical process, but a gut feeling, and massively overwhelming. As they were moving around in front of us, more appeared and mixed among them, all the while running about fast in front of us. My son and I were backing toward the truck. I would not present my back to them, and some of them peeled off right and left in an encirclement movement. They were rolling in fast from the sides now. I could smell and feel their presence. We got to the truck, loaded on adrenaline and ready to kill, as we both knew we were in grave danger. We piled into the truck, locked the doors. I had keys out and ready as my butt neared the seat. I had the engine lit and transmission in gear and gas pedal, mashed in one motion. Adrenaline is great stuff, as we fled. Yes, we fled. Something very close by let out an undulating scream of rage and pain. I believe one or more of the group had gotten really close to us in their pursuit, and I ran over the foot of one of them. Yeah, they were that close. We rolled onto the highway and I told my son to watch the bed of the pickup as well as the trailer. He already was indexed to the rear with the shotgun. We hauled ass for at least 20 miles before the feeling of grave danger started to abate. The feeling that nailed both of us, as we discussed soon afterward, was one of being prey and soon to be slaughtered and eaten. I am not easily led and neither believe nor disbelieve all the Bigfoot ghost and werewolf stuff. In fact, I am skeptical. My son was speaking with a co-worker about six months later who had grown up in Prospect, Oregon, about 30 miles south of Union Creek where the incident took place. He asked Jake if he had ever heard of any strange things going on in the area. Jake went ashy white and pretty much retold the above tale. He says to avoid the place at night. A family friend, a 25-year retired cop not given to flights of fancy and an excellent observer, had a tale very similar from a year before. I told my wife of this event, of course. She looked at me at the beginning as though I had developed a third eyeball in the center of my forehead. That was from shock. She did believe me, but did not wish to hear any details. She said the tale gave her chills. Me too, as I write this. Hair on the back of my neck and forearms is sticking up. I have not gone back to explore, and would not without a large group of shotgun and flamethrower-equipped men with me. My son and I are both sane, sober people, and not taken to hysteria. We were wide very wide awake as things transpired. We saw and smelled what was there. As a sidebar, neither of us heard footfalls from the creatures. They were silent until I heard one as we were getting the hell out of there. To my knowledge, and I have researched, there is nothing that matches these creatures unless one considers old legends and folk tales of were-creatures. To conclude, I have to fall back on Elmer Keith's famous line. Hell, I was there. So uh, easy to overlook part of this story that I think is important. He said it was as if they sprung out of the ground. 
It makes me think that they came out of the Shadowverse. They came out of the Shadowverse from the ground, from the shadows in the ground, and they came at him. Like how, unless they dug tunnels. He said they're hairy and they're tall, and these things weren't shadowy. Like, uh, neither was the goblin that the guy saw in the last story. It wasn't shadowy, it had gray skin. But again, I think it matters what state they're in when they're here. If they fully come in the flesh, they're gonna look normal. The more partially out of this world they are, the more darker they look. And the more into this world they look, it, it starts to get more gray or white. That's why people see the weird white or grayish creatures. And then when they're fully here, color. Like colorful, like green skin or brown skin or whatever. I really think there's a spectrum, a gradient. The more here they are, the more normal color they look. The more oh, in the other world they are, the darker they look. And I think that makes sense. So he saw them spring from the ground, one point. The second one that relates to shamanism and this weird energy that they're producing is the intense feeling of fear, like he's gonna get murdered. A lot of people who encounter the paranormal, I think this has something to do with the energy field generated with interdimensional travel and coming out of the shadow verse. That feeling of fear from the closet, that feeling of fear coming from under the bed, that feeling of fear is an energy field that does not feel good to be in. It could be more than that. It could be intent, it could be, uh, it could be some kind of psychic attack that they're doing, I don't know. But I've experienced that eerie feeling before, that very, it, the hair stick on the back of your neck, it feels very scary. And I was able to rationally think about it and determine that it was an energy in the air that was making me feel this really oppressive, creepy feeling. So I believe it has something to do with the shamanic or electromagnetic energy field that's being generated by these strange creatures. Another thing that makes me think it's more to do with energy than to do with them being evil is a guy that I, uh, back when my YouTube was popular, before I quit making videos because all the creepy, weird stuff that happened to me, this guy told me he was truck driving to Area 51 and he wasn't allowed to see anything. You know, they were really strict with him. But when he was parked in the hangar unloading, he felt an intensely eerie, scary feeling. And I was like, nothing was attacking him. It must be something to do with the technology or the doorways are opening to the Shadowverse or the energy being produced by the strange super technology that they have in top secret military facilities that has to do with this interdimensional travel, that has to do with these cryptids that know how to do it already, these strange humanoids from other worlds that know how to do it already. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're evil. But with this last story, I do think they're trying to kill him and eat him. So yes, that is pretty evil or predatory. Like, it's pretty predatory. Definitely not something you want to be around. All right, guys, I hope you found this video interesting. Remember, if you liked it, comment, Click the like button, subscribe, and share this video in your Facebook groups, on Reddit pages, help promote my channel again. If you guys have any interesting stories, email me at thezenohunter at AOL.com. And stay tuned for next week when I produce another video every Friday. I actually might start producing more content and sporadically releasing them, but my main event for the week is gonna be every Friday. So stay tuned. Until next time, guys, this is Kitavitok. Peace out.